Hello, everyone. Everybody hear me well? Yeah? On t'entend. Yeah, okay, cool. So, uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you. Uh, I'm Felix, and I will be the MC for this event. So, uh, I'm kind of near uh, to an highway, so sorry if you heard bike or car or something like that. Uh, let me introduce you the party TypeScript team. So we got Lydian that will handle the stream. Uh, we got uh, Sylvan that will communicate on Twitter and moderate chat with Paul and Terence. Uh, first of all, thank you all for watching the second party TypeScript online meetup. Uh, so I got some slides to introduce you this meetup. Uh, so this is our 26th uh, meetup since Parity TypeScript creation, and we organize meetup every two months on the first Tuesday. Uh, we make various events, like a regular special event where we focus on some topic, uh, apero. So like uh, before, don't know if this means anything in English, but uh, this is where we drink and talk about TypeScript and uh, the online meetup like right now. So if you want to support us, uh, we are on Open Collective. So this money allow us um, to pay the meetup, domain name for the website, uh, record even, and etc. And if you want to discuss about TypeScript, we can stay in touch with uh, the Paris TypeScript community. Where we have a Slack that we can join. We have a GitHub repository, and I will talk about it later. And we also have a YouTube channel where you can see past uh, recorded event. Uh, so all the Parry TypeScript team is on Twitter. Uh, the meetup also have an account where we publish information about the next event. So if you don't want to miss news about the next uh, meetup, you can follow the Parry TypeScript Twitter's account. So we have a GitHub repository where you can submit talk on issue tabs. Uh, we always search speakers, so don't be shy. We can help you. We search every level, every topic. And of course, it has to be related to TypeScript, but we are very open-minded about the topic. Also, uh, thanks to our Lil Bro Paridino meetup that helped us to set up this online event. Thank you very much. And now things get real. So the first talk is uh, serverless made easy for developer with WRAP.js, Warp JS, so by uh, Dominique Perret and Nicolas Penek. And the next <laughs> and the next, what? I was just saying, hey, because I <laughs> was thinking it was for us, but sorry, I'll let you continue. No, sorry. Then we have uh, Adopting TypeScript, Good and Bad Reason, and How to Do It by Alexandra Sikora from Asura. Uh, and that's all. So uh, thank you to all speaker. We are very happy to have you. Uh, you, can, you can follow them on Twitter. And uh, last but not thing, if you have question, you can use the hashtag question on YouTube's live chat. And now it's time to begin. So thanks for your attention. And now let's get started. Okay, so it's us now. I'm going to share a screen. Okay, it's coming. So we'll be two people presenting. And the logo is gone. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I play. No, it doesn't work in the full full screen so okay we'll, we'll do it that way <laughs> okay so uh we will introduce a serverless uh, new serverless approach uh, called warp js uh this is a product our develop our company developed so uh, a word about the speakers first so uh here it's uh nicolas and uh Hi. and myself dominic so nicolas is a uh, really well known in the uh, open source uh, next uh, ecosystem and uh, is also the co-organizer of the RENJS uh, meetup and I myself I'm a former CTO of a company in Brittany and now I'm a more or less a developer advocate uh, dev evangelist whatever you want to call that but I like to actually talk to developers about uh, these new technologies 
and uh, and here we go. So what is WorkJS? So it's um, I will just read that an opinionated platform that turns JavaScript modules into serverless APIs with no HTTP SL. How to turn a module in serverless API? Uh, this is actually the core of our approach. Uh, this is really something you've never seen. Uh, so, sorry, but we don't see very well your, your slide. You you do, you don't uh, click on play. Yeah, but it doesn't work. I don't know why. I I don't don't work. Okay. I don't Man, know why. Try play there. No, it doesn't work. Okay. Oh, and there you know, there's, a, there's a Google. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, the Google bug. The Google bug. Yeah. Sorry. Of course, it's just the. <laughs> no uh, problem. Okay. Demo effect, not even with warp again. <laughs> so maybe maybe we can zoom or something. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll put put that full screen. Yeah, a bit better maybe. No, sorry, sorry for that, guys. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is, this is a unique approach to uh, actually you take a JavaScript module and uh, you you use the magic tools uh, provided by warp, uh, common line interfaces, and then you get a serverless plus the API client on the other side. So this is this is for your promise. Uh, how it works, let's get in with uh, Nicola. Okay, so we will switch to uh, to the so VS Code. So uh, for tonight, I just uh, will present you um, a demo project built on uh, on top of a view with TypeScript and so WebJS. And just to don't waste your time, I already prepared a project this afternoon. Uh, so it's uh, a project built from the Vue uh, CLI uh, because I'm a big fan of Vue uh, and uh, I like uh, TypeScript too. So you can easily create a project with uh, these two uh, awesome technologies. Just have to install so the Vue GS uh, client, uh, CLI, sorry. Then you just uh, launch the, this command to create a project. And if you want TypeScript, it's very, very easy. You just uh, view add TypeScript and you will scale, scale for automatically a uh, project uh, is, uh, like as below. This is our architecture with all the, um, the package install uh, for view and TypeScript. And uh, you just add to, to turn uh, on your server and you can play. I so will use Yarn, but uh, you can uh, use NPM if you want. So this command line you already run. Okay, so the project is scaffolded with a uh, TypeScript. Yes. And so let's now uh, add a, a backend and uh, to see how it works with the regular way of uh, HTTP. So okay, this is uh, the scaffolding project of this view and TypeScript. I will make this uh, project more uh, fancy. For example, I will remove my uh, view logo and the uh, Hello World components, and I will add. The logo from uh, Paris uh, TypeScript, and I will treat with you an, uh, a new component, uh, a, user, a user list to print um, a user card from uh, data from an, an external API. So the, the use case here is we, let's say we want to create a proxy. Uh, we don't want the, the client directly to request uh, said APIs but, uh, or said uh, uh, HTTP uh, REST uh, API. And we just uh, want to create uh, some part of backend that we add as a proxy to reshape uh, the, the JSON we want. So we go, we will go to the, this new component. I already created, but uh, it's a very uh, classical component. We have a title, user list, and a list of uh, users. Just dump the data, and the data are right are art coded in the in the component. And as you know. Uh, you can use as a um, decorator from TypeScript and the language uh, TypeScript directly in view. And it's very awesome, uh, this feature. Uh, easy, very easy to use TypeScript with view. So it's art coded here, my data, it's user, and it's print here. We have the library load. Okay, so I have my data here. It works. So now I will make uh, something more fancy. Oh. I'm a cheater, so <laughs> I just remove my code. And okay, we have the powerful live reload from Vue.js. Uh, so you can see the user card from the data are coded. We have Jack, John, and Julia. And now we will uh, fetch the data uh, from an API. Instead to have hard coded, we will uh, 
on a mounted of the of the view of the component user list we will call the load method and in this load method i will uh, fetch uh, an api to have uh, this data and print it but currently i don't have this server so i will build it with you yeah this user's restful api has to be coded so let's get into it so to go quicker, I'll, I will uh, show you the, an example of Express Server built with Node. When when you want to create an API, you have uh, to 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 run an Express Server. You have to handle the security with core I mean, and uh, with uh, awesome library like uh, Helmet. Uh, often you have to handle uh, the, the compression and many many other stuff about security and devops uh, and uh, you have so to up, uh, declare your power your express you handle uh, your error here i just write a simple global error handler you you you, you declare your middleware and then you have to define edge route for example a slash for the root a uh, world uh, get user for this example, or for example, movie search, we will search movies, etc. Uh, so in this method, you have to, to handle uh, the, um, the HTTP uh, request. Uh, for example, we can check, we can pick the query parameter with uh, this way, but uh, we don't have the type of this, uh, this uh, parameter. This is always a string by default. And then I can uh, call my real uh, function in the API verify. And in this file, it's just my real logic business. For example, get user and get user will uh, fetch an API from the well-known uh, decent placeholder API. I think you know this API for uh, some uh, tests and more. But you can uh, call a uh, DV or whatever. So this is uh, the classical way to, to, to write a server. So I will go in this server, press and I just start. Uh, so we start, I will test it. Uh, okay, it works. Uh, okay, my server is up and running. So, so we got a proxy ready. Yes, and so the regular way, I go back to my project and I will fetch the data from the localhost and uh, have the response JSON and return user object. Uh, with the livelihood, it should work. Okay, now it's uh, the, the real data from the API. So it's a very classical way. And of course, if now, if you want a push in production, you have to change this URL because uh, we, we, it's not localhost. We have to, to switch between the different environments, for example, production environment or any, any other stuff. Yeah, there, there are, what you're saying is behind this, we have like hidden cost uh, mm -hmm. where you have a, a front end calling an API uh, to a certain URL with a certain contract. And we have a back end with a, sharing mm -hmm. the same contract, obviously. And uh, there's also a uh, life cycle management uh, changing in the API of the back end. And uh, uh, we, we need to manage the uh, development local uh, pre-production, staging, production, whatever client environment we can have. So it's it's a whole work to to manage this communication between those two sides, server mm -hmm. and client, be, being front end, back end, or being a microservice with another proxy or another server, whatever. So uh, and how long uh, did it take for you in real life um, to, uh, to create this uh, HTTP layer uh, server and, and client? Uh, it depends on your experience with, with uh, Node.js. Uh, if you are familiar with Node.js and Express, maybe a couple of hours to just uh, charge your server and uh, to, to uh, define your route um, okay. and without uh, any uh, deployment on the cloud. For, for, for this okay. example, it's only local server. Yeah, a couple of hours plus uh, for the lifetime project, uh, the yes. length of the lifetime project maintain all this yes, and yes. to manage uh, in real world production the the security the cores and everything okay yeah. so uh now let's now see uh how we would do it with work yes. uh what we need what we don't need anymore yes. and uh what we can save here so uh first uh we 
to, to, to work with WARP, we, we need to install WARP, of course. So you have to uh, install uh, two, uh, the two main dependency. So it's the WARP uh, GS engine as a dependency and uh, WARP as a Dave dependency. And then I will treat uh, a, new, a new server. Your side, on this side, we can see the front end uh, structure, but uh, I will write my server inside it. But if you want to uh, create a monorepo or two projects, you can. Uh, you can choose uh, your uh, project structure, structure. So for this example, I will create in the same project. So no. to the server, I needed my project and I started Axios. And okay. And then uh, I have to, to, to um, I would stop my, uh, you, you have to log in first to, uh, to WARP. So WARP.js is, is coming with cloud, okay, yes. with cloud execution and cloud building. So this is why you need to first create an account on WARP.js.com. And, uh, and there, here you just log in once uh, for your, at your, at the user level on a machine. Yes. And then you can uh, reuse it on all projects. Yes, and you need to have login to, to see your own project and so uh, have uh, the, the good ride on the good project. So we are logging and now uh, we just create a WARF config GS file. So I go back to my server folder. Uh, I just add some stuff about TypeScript, but it's uh, out, of, out of scope. So I just with the WARF config uh, GS, uh, and on this file, we will, we will see two, the two main um, configurations. Uh, so, so part of the configuration in here in this file, where we say what would be the output format for the client side, because out of a module, WARF GS will create the server side, which is actually the backend running mm -hmm. code, and the client side, we will sharing the same definition for the function, for the module, uh, and so it, it acts like a wrapper, uh, like, a, like a helper module to call very easily uh, the server side with no HTTP. Yes. So here we're basically saying, yeah, I'm generating a module that I'll yes. be able to import in my client uh, project. So if I go back in my project, now I can remove my Express example because all of the stuff about Express is totally useless now. And we will just treat- You, you uh, just delete the Express folder. Yes. Just yes, like that. Yes. This guy's crazy. And, okay. and just for the fun, I convert my index uh, GS uh, Express in a TypeScript uh, in TypeScript file. So now my index TS file is the same things, but with uh, some types uh, for, uh, for from TypeScript. But is, uh, okay. we can see the, the same uh, method, the get user. We will fetch the data plus the type definition, and I will return user. So we are on server side. We are the we have the configuration the WARF config file. So now our project is configured, and now we will just use uh, the three command from from the um, WARF command line, and we will add it to to our front end project. So let's open my package from. Okay. Uh, so here in this in this example, uh, we, as we said, we can organize the code the way we want. Here we're really front-end driven. We're like a front-end who, who would dream to be a full stack, actually, and so is, is really putting the back-end, the proxy project, as a, a sub-project of its main uh, front-end project. This is a way where, actually, in a front-end, you can serve yourself, help yourself with the data you need. So here we're creating the proxy as a sub-project mm -hmm. of the front-end project. And so, because we don't have the, the Express, we need to, to, to launch a server side, a uh, server for the, for the server side. And as you know, the server side is, uh, is for the serverless. So we can launch uh, our uh, serverless emulator with this command. I just use an, an helper, but it's the same command to that launch. And the start emulator, we will watch the server project. And on the other side, I will rerun my my front end, it's a, it's a yes or yes answer to, to launch the view. So now my view is run, my serverless simulator is run. Uh, now it's time to connect the two parts. So I will go back to the user list and instead to, to call the API, I will remove it. So here we just removed 
uh, the URL, yes. so the root, yes. <laughs> and we let Wob do whatever it's going to do. Yes. <laughs> let Wob do its magic, actually. But here we, we basically remove the uh, environment management. Yes. And now we will uh, institute so to, to make a HTTP call. We just import a module, uh, uh, yeah, not, not a nat yeah, nat native JavaScript module from the node module. And I will rename it my API. And I want you can see this name here. And you can uh, see the same name from here because it's a configuration to, to, to set this name here. OK, this is where we connect. Yeah. So okay. I have my API. I ju you just have to init your API to get uh, which uh, method from the API you want. For example, here I'm just destructuring the get user, but you can uh, take uh, other stuff. Uh, I will remove my mock. It's useless. I already uh, import so uh, some uh, user type from the back end um, directly in the front end automatically. Also, I declare my so, array. So, Warp is sharing that. Warp is sharing yes. uh, classes like uh, components of the modules you declared. Yes, yes, because okay. we you don't have the, you don't have HTTP be, be, uh, between the JavaScript front end and the back end front end. You can. Uh, make a natural call in JavaScript between the two parts. And so we can share the, the chip between the these two parts. Okay, so it shares the types, but it mm -hmm. shares also, uh, as you're going to show us, uh, the function itself. Yes. Well, so so there it means that we, we're calling a backend function from a front end project, but we have no HTTP. Yes. It sounds like impossible. It sounds we're <laughs> calling a local function, but it's not actually. It's not natural, but it's uh, the powerful of WarpJS. And but it's logic. You are in JavaScript in front end. You are in JavaScript in back end. Why use HTTP between these two parts? But okay, we will see the we will see that together. So I just here uh, uh, make a call to my uh, get user uh, function in the front end, like uh, in, in the front end for to the to the back end. I print into the users. Uh, we have the live reload in emulator and front end. Uh, and you can see now the data are the same, but uh, now it comes from the, the work module. Is just one question about the function here. It's, like, it's an actual question. I'm not acting. Um, <laughs> just one question. This is this has to be an asynchronous function on the back end too. Uh, the the get users. Yes. Yes. When you call this, uh, the okay. get user go to the uh, to the up indexed server, and we can. Yeah, this is HTTP as async. It's an async function yeah, it's here. It's async so, await. So it means that any under the only condition that a, a function is asynchronous on the backend side, mm -hmm. if you share the module with warp, it begins to be accessible from the front end project. Yes, but it's like an, any HTTP request. We are on the yeah, on yeah the root of the web. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you it's just share. You, you, this is the only requirement, finally. Yeah. To, the function has to be asynchronous, and then you can share it uh, yes. with its module. OK. So now we will want to add uh, some, some, some information on the user card. For example, uh, I want to add uh, an avatar. I would add the, the workplace and maybe the city name for each user. And why not? Uh, you can add uh, a system of uh, system of uh, pagination. Instead to load all the user, we which we will uh, load each uh, user by, uh, for example, three by three. A very uh, common stuff in web. So, okay. okay. Need, uh, now I need my image and my data, so I have to uh, go back to the backend and add uh, this data. So let's say we have a, a user, a new request from a user from the product owner saying, "Yeah, yes. we want the image. We want uh, also the uh, the uh, the uh, phone numbers and so." So instead of recreating a different API contract and managing the upgrade and production with the uh, outage, probably if you don't. Uh, uh, have of both versions working in production. Mm. Uh, here, we what we do then? So here, I will just uh, so add, uh, keep only useful attributes to have a lighter uh, request uh, on the on the web, and uh, then 
why it's blue. Okay, because I uh, forgot my return data and return data then. So I just, I'm on backend. I will uh, take my data users. I will get only data and, uh, and add a new avatar. On the side, we have, uh, okay, live reload, uh, no error, the front end is reload to, oh, it's, okay, let's go. Okay. We have uh, our avatar and city, but now. So here we, we, we've seen that we got uh, both uh, front and back end live reload. Yeah. The server stays connected uh, to the server simulator, and the, the front end obviously uh, is connected uh, with this live reload with Vue. So okay. now, I mean, uh, now I, I will I will add the pagination. So it's very basic pagination. I just make a slice on the uh, on the array with a page and limit on the uh, entry input. And the entry is an object. It's another string. You can type so the entry. And it's very common for TypeScript uh, users. And I will go back to my user list and I just replace. I get user by uh, get user here and add some options. So I just add option about page limits, page uh, page number and which limit on the page. Just to my private attributes. And then I will get user with my options because as you can see, uh, option is optional. <laughs> okay, okay. And then I just contact my, uh, my user data with uh, the previous and increase uh, the page number. Reload it. Okay, it's don't work. Uh, why, why, why? Ah, because uh, I just forgot to remove it. Okay, it's reloaded. Uh, we can show more, show more, and it's okay. And the last user. So as you can see, it's very easy to have a live. Um, to 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 write a new feature is very fast because you just you don't have to 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 rerun the server and refresh the server. It's uh, we have the power full of JavaScript. We have the the live reload from TypeScript and then from the emulator and then from the the Vue.js. And okay, but we speak about serverless, but <laughs> currently it's not very serverless. So. We have a command for that. <laughs> ah, okay. You're talking about leaving the local uh, test, uh, local running, and then going into yes into the cloud. Uh, okay. Let's stop my my emulator. And now I will just run a new command, and we will see together. So I just run this command deploy. This command we will uh, some stuff. First, it will build the Vue.js. Uh, client. So to create the bundle uh, to, to deploy it. Yeah, sorry, it will be built before the, the server and then the, the Vue.js and then it will deploy on production. Open. So here, yeah. here the, uh, the WebJS deploys in a different environment from what we got locally, but we didn't put anywhere uh, the URL, uh, the uh, on front end, on back end, we didn't say where we, we are going to request. Actually, WebJS is managing that for us. And WebJS is always uh, managing front end, back end as peers, uh, always able to talk to each other. Meaning that if you redeploy uh, a few minutes later another version, the previous version is still live until nobody calls it again. So it's really deployed as like different apps, and the front end always comes with its back end. So it means it's always working. Deploy. Depend of your network, but, uh, because we have the, the full screen yeah. sharing. It's a bit slow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it will open. And as you can see, maybe we can share the, this link on the. I don't have it actually. Oh. <laughs> well, we'll we'll do. Uh, we will do after. So we are on. Uh, we have deployed on a GCP on Google. Uh, we have the, the front end deployed on a CDN, and when. I it's on show more. Oh, okay, it's work. Nice. <laughs> no, we so, didn't test the pagination actually. Yeah, yeah. We test only on production yeah. here. Yeah. yeah. No and, problem. <laughs> and so if you if you if you use with many many people on the same time, the front end come from the CDN, and the back end come from the serverless. So you have the the powerful of the serverless with infinite scale. Uh, yeah. 
we have different uh, deployment options for for WebJS, but here it's deployed on Google Functions mm -hmm. uh, for the backend, obviously, and the front end is in a storage. We, as we see in the uh, the URL, it's a temporary beta URL. Uh, on, on on the real product, uh, we are we are currently implementing Amazon Lambda, obviously, Azure Functions, of course, and uh, we also for our first customers uh, um, creating the system to deploy on premise and on private clouds and to uh, via Docker and uh, with Kubernetes. And ju just on this example, I only uh, uh, export one method, but uh, of course you can export uh, many, many functions in the same time you can split your code in any JavaScript, uh, in, a, in a few JavaScript projects, you are in a native JavaScript. So you don't, you can use any, any, any with, tech, yeah. Go to the slide, it's in here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, just a, a, just a, a couple of slides to, to end this. Uh, so in a nutshell, we've seen three key common lines. Uh, start emulator to work local, build to uh, prepare the bundles uh, to integrate into your CI, for example, and the deploy command that deploys uh, the first folder being the uh, server at the back end and the uh, second folder being the client, for example, the front end. Next. And uh, so to sum up, it's agnostic because um, actually WebJS was built at the language level, at the mm -hmm. JavaScript level. Uh, so it works with any framework, uh, with any bundler, and you can organize the code uh, the way you want. And uh, so it's natively JavaScript, so it works on any uh, JavaScript uh, sub-language. And uh, it's, uh, no, sorry. TypeScript is not a sub language. It's a super language. This is this is the one we should we should all use. Sorry, <laughs> this is not what I meant. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, the uh, the module generation means that we work at the module level. We turn modules into serverless. So it means that module is compatible also uh, for everything uh, with JavaScript. Just import it and it's working. And npm on Yarn can be used uh, at the uh, command line scripts. And uh, so about, about the uh, deployment I already. Uh, said a word about it so it's always a serverless spirit okay uh, but sometimes you want still want it to to work on your own servers uh, that you manage yourself being private on premise or even on public and uh, but we we prefer uh, uh, if you don't know how, how, how large you want to scale that you probably uh, deploy on a, on a real serverless mean fun function as a service environment such as Amazon Lambda or as a Azure functions. You, it's over. Uh, finish. We, I think we got a question already. I've seen that. So uh, from Asperus, the only question. Thank you, guy. <laughs> <laughs> Warp uh, JS takes your backend code and generates asynchronous function, uh, asynchronous client functions for RPC. It's like RPC. It's interesting. Yeah, uh, in a different. Probably 20 years ago, we were said that what JS is a uh, middleware. <laughs> we could say that. Uh, today we say it's a platform as a service. It's uh, more precisely a function as a service with a different approach. Uh, it's not only generate the client actually, as you said, you've seen that the uh, server uh, is also managed for you. For the server, you just develop the logic of the function. You don't develop the pipes. You don't develop the communication. You just okay. I want my function to do that. And then you call it. <laughs> we we have uh, deleted uh, hundreds of lines of code uh, that was yeah. just to manage the roots, to manage the the layer we're not supposed to to work with actually at the development level. Uh, uh, if we take a, a step back and to look at the big picture, actually uh, the the server client architecture, back end front end architecture is not a design choice. You don't do it by choice. You just have to do it because the data is, is somewhere uh, and you, the browser is somewhere else. And you, this is a constraint you, ha we, you actually have today to build applications. The goal of WebJS is just to remove that constraint. You code somewhere, okay, let's say I'm in the front end environment and oh, I want this to run in the back end. Yeah, just warp it and that's it. You warp something, it's running back end and you can just call it as if it were local. Any any other question? Maybe we just uh, just in time, right in time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm probably I got one, one question. 
Uh, is yeah. there a, a free offer to try the, the product? Uh, yeah, currently it's a beta. So the beta is uh, obviously free. Okay, we don't make customers pay for the beta. Some okay. did, but they, they had specific requirements. Uh, the beta program is getting to an end. Uh, uh, in 10 days, uh, we, we will uh, shut down the, uh, the, the beta program because actually the product is ready and we already signed customers. So it's our signal to say, okay, we now have a product, <laughs> another technology. And, uh, and uh, so we, there will be uh, uh, still a free trial um, for uh, a 30, 30 days trial. Uh, there won't be, uh, it's changing every day, so I'm not sure. But there, will, there won't be probably not a free offer, but uh, the CEO just changed his mind recently, so he can rechange his mind again. Uh, we, we, are, we were considering, and maybe we consider again to, to have for startups uh, who want to uh, share with us their experience, something free, uh, but whatever, it will, it will very, be a very low price. Uh, but you have to think we, we run some, some code in production. So would we rely on something that is free? What is the service behind? So for low money, even for low money, it's, it's uh, very nice to have SLAs, to have uh, real people behind this to, uh, to manage your the production. Okay, thank you. <laughs> There are any other questions? Okay, currently not. Okay, I think that's all. So, so you, you can always ask to, sorry, um, just a little thing to finish. The, the Medium WebJS uh, contains tutorials for Angular, for uh, Vue.js, and for React. Uh, so it's really step-by-step uh, -step explained, uh, as easy as you as you just seen. Uh, so it's a five minute tutorial and uh, so, so feel free to uh, to uh, use the, our Twitter unders to uh, send us uh, any further question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Okay. So thank you very much for, for your talk. Uh, so if you have a further question, uh, you can ask them, uh, I think on Twitter, you can uh, ping them or uh, something like that. TypeScript adoption. Uh, yes, hello. I will start showing my screen. Yes, no. Okay, I hope everything is working fine. So, uh, hello again, and I'm really glad to, to have this opportunity to speak at Paris TypeScript Meetup. And let me introduce myself. So, uh, my name is Alexandra, and I work at Hasura as tech lead for the uh, front-end open source application that I'm also going to show uh, later. And I also co-organize both for TypeScript Meetup. And here are some links. You can find me on Twitter, as Alexandra says, as uh, bureaus on GitHub, and I have a blog, alexandra.codes, when I uh, write about computer science. And uh, agenda looks like this. At first, I will um, talk a bit about why would we even want to add TypeScript to JavaScript project. And I will also say about some popular approaches uh, there are to, to go with this adoption. And I will present you our story at Hasura, how, um, like what approach uh, we took and how it's going. So let's get started. So uh, as you are uh, attending this meetup, you probably already think that TypeScript is pretty cool and I don't need to convince uh, you so, but uh, you know, when somebody is asking you what, what is cool about TypeScript, there are some, some things like this optional static typing, so you can use it or, or not. Uh, there is definitely typed, uh, which means that there is a great community behind TypeScript. There are all those fancy tools you have in your ID, and you also have VS Code written in TypeScript, which has like, you know, first class support for TypeScript, which is cool. Uh, you have documentation, two types, I have easier refactors, and so on. So, uh, you know, when I was talking about TypeScript at Hasura and Helena, I was like, you know, trying to convince people to 
uh, Adobe TypeScript, I was also using this, uh, these arguments at first. But the truth is that they don't actually matter because uh, your management or your clients, they won't care if you have you know, better hints or more fancy tools in your ID. And they don't even care about your developer experience. They care about uh, how fast you can ship features and how fast you can solve problems. So, um, you know, we kind of need to change this, this perspective and uh, don't advertise TypeScript as a language, but uh, focus on solving real life problems and focus on our projects, on our teams, and, you know, about pe on people and uh, answer the question what problems TypeScript can solve for us. Because, you know, what other language is great? Probably Rust. But you know, writing all JavaScript applications to Rust might not be the best idea. So, uh, what is the context here? So, this is mostly people, as I, as I said, it's your team because you know your team uh, is uh, people in your team are the the ones that are going to write in this language on a daily basis, and they need to be comfortable with that. They need to be confident about this choice as well, and they need to be you know part of the decision. Also, this is your management, your clients, your contributors. And uh, also what you need to include in this, uh, in this context is your project, your tech stack, because possibly uh, maybe not for all projects uh, with some particular tech stacks, uh, TypeScript will be a good idea. So as he said, uh, instead of focusing on all, the, all those fancy features of, of the language, we can uh, focus on solving our problems in our project. So how to do it? First, we need to define them because maybe you don't have any problems. Maybe you don't need TypeScript at all. And then, uh, then we can start thinking how to solve them. And here I have some examples. For example, uh, first one is maybe uh, in your company, in your project, the problem is with productivity and you develop features really, really slow. So how, how to help with that? You can say that TypeScript can increase our productivity because first you have this documentation so you can you know, onboard uh, more uh, developers faster. You have this good ID support and developer experience which allows you to you know, uh, write more code faster. And also what, uh, like the other thing that types are really good for is catching all the bugs faster, uh, like during developing by type checker, uh, instead of like, you know, just uh, letting them to lurk in the code and be discovered uh, later. Another reason, uh, another problem that we may have and you may want to solve is that we don't want our clients to discover our bugs. You won't uh, have them like as little as possible. And this is, uh, this is something that TypeScript can help us with because many, many uh, issues, many, many bugs can be, can be noticed with uh, static type checking. And another thing, maybe, uh, maybe your company is growing really fast and hiring more and more developers, or maybe you have a lot of contribut contributors. So uh, this is another reason why TypeScript may help us because um, as I mentioned before, uh, types are great documentation and uh, like in the contrary of uh, you know, having documentation in a separate place or having comments, it won't ever get outdated because it's type check during every run of the compiler. So now let's talk about some popular approaches uh, that there are for, for adopting TypeScript. Um, the first one is to not write TypeScript at all. Just, uh, just you know, add tsconfig and write jsdoc. Um, have this uh, check JS flag enabled so TypeScript can go through all, your, all, your, all of your JavaScript code and notify you about all the, all the issues. 
And this might be especially useful if you are already uh, using JSDoc in many places in your code. But uh, here you also need to be aware that uh, there are some there are some uh, trade-offs when, when you are using JSDoc. Uh, for example, uh, type assertions are really hard to, eat, to read uh, with, with JSDoc. Um, there's also this problem that uh, if, if you have any typo or, or bug in your JSDoc, TypeScript won't, uh, won't annotate your expression. Uh, it, just, uh, it will just ignore it. So this is something to keep in mind. Uh, second reason is to use uh, non-strict TypeScript everywhere. So basically, you are um, you are uh, taking all of your code and you are converting all of your JavaScript files to TypeScript files, and you have uh, loose settings. So uh, you know you basically uh, you just uh, Allow TypeScript to to uh, to uh, have this like basic uh, benefits, and then you would gradually increase strictness and add more and more uh, compiler settings, like those strict settings. A third way uh, is kind of similar uh, because um, it also uh, is about you know. Doing something with all the code, all of the code base, so you you can have strict settings, and uh, you know uh, write all of, all of your JavaScript code in uh, with those strict settings, and for your uh, for your uh, JavaScript code you can uh, generate uh, declaration files, and you can use uh, DTS Gen for from Microsoft to do this. But here, um, what, what is important to remember is that um, there is some kind of a trade-off. In those generated uh, declarations, you're going to see a lot of any types. And as, as mentioned in the readme of the TS gen, uh, this is meant to be a starting point for writing high-quality definition files. Um, another thing to, to remember uh, about doing like uh, about creating declaration files is that you're going to have um, you have you're going to have it well typed whenever you are using the, those modules, but inside of the module uh, you're going to only have uh, this basic TypeScript support for JavaScript file. So um, so uh, so this is an example. I have declaration file. Or, uh, for some component button. However, in, inside of this uh, button uh, component, uh, my, I still see any. And there is a, a fourth option, uh, the last one. You can also have strict settings and uh, use allow JS plug uh, that will, uh, that will tape scrap TypeScript that it can compile uh, all JavaScript files to, to infer types from there. And then you can gradually convert files from JavaScript to TypeScript. Uh, what's, uh, there, there's a note here that uh, it may take some time to see all the TypeScript benefits because you know when you are starting and you have only a few files from, uh, from many of them are in TypeScript, then you may not see all of those uh, all of those benefits from using TypeScript. However, um, TypeScript is in fact a gradually typed language, and what does it mean? What is gradual typing? Uh, it's something that allows you to have both dynamic and static typing, and um, and this is this approach that kind of get what you invest. So uh, you can have as many uh, static, statically typed files as you want. You have as many uh, static typing as you want. And uh, you can, as, as the name says, you can gradually convert from uh, dynamic to, to static uh, typing. And uh, 
And what's also cool is because maybe you don't want all of your code to be in TypeScript. Maybe you just want some part of your application to be migrated. Uh, then this is, uh, this is possible thanks to gradual typing. Okay, now uh, TypeScript at Castora, how, how it was uh, in our case. Firstly, I, I want to tell you like really quickly what Hasura is. So um, Hasura connects to your data sources, like your database, your external GraphQL services, microservices, servers, functions, and produces unified GraphQL API on top of that. And uh, this is the, the Hasura console, the project that uh, is currently migrated to TypeScript. So you can see here that there is this GraphQL panel when you can uh, test your API. There is data section, uh, which is kind of like a UI for the database. And there are some other tabs when you can uh, configure uh, some Hasura features. So um, in our case, it wasn't just uh, why TypeScript? It was at first, why static typing? Because we, we didn't know um, the beginning, whether we want to use TypeScript or something else. So we started those, uh, those discussions from uh, why do we even care about static typing? And here are some reasons. So uh, because the, the best way to convince people about something is by examples. So uh, the first reason is productivity. And uh, you see here that it was kind of like a stupid bug because um, we have this schema name and table schema all over the places. And it always means the same thing. And this is the, the, uh, the code I wrote, I guess on Friday. And then I, I spent like one hour trying to debug what's going wrong because uh, you no, know, it was so hard to notice what, why, why this is not working, why I, I don't see any columns in the UI. And, uh, and it turned out that it was just, you know, just a mismatch because, uh, and this was a JavaScript file and it was treated just like a dictionary that this call object. So there was no crash uh, whatsoever, no runtime error. Uh, it was just, you know, uh, each table in the UI had no so, um, so this is the uh, first thing that uh, this, is, this was our problem, productivity. And uh, we, we, we were thinking that static typing uh, is a way to, to help us with that. Then we also want less issues reported because, you know, uh, no one wants to spend uh, much time on fixing bugs. So, um, so uh, you know, this, this help of static typing to prevent some uh, runtime errors uh, is, is highly appreciated. And this is another story of a bug. I'm still there, just drinking water. Uh, so uh, someone did a pull request and there was this a uh, current migration mode taken from state and uh, this, this migration mode property was renamed to current migration mode. And then while refactoring this, um, the person didn't notice the rename part. And the same day uh, as it was merged and as it was released as a beta version, uh, someone created an issue because this, um, you know, you could say that this is one line back, but this back uh, prevented users from uh, from creating migrations in the console. And this is uh, basically one of the most important points of the of the Hasura console. So another thing that uh, you would like to avoid, because if you if we had this state properly typed in TypeScript, it wouldn't happen. Uh, because we, we would be notified about this error during, uh, during build time. Okay, and uh, another thing is, you know, because often when 
we are talking about static typing and about you know adding static typing and there is this argument that uh, you can just write more tests and we have a lot of tests we have like really really a lot of tests but uh, you know there are just kind of stupid bugs for example like you know uh, someone is using a function that doesn't exist or some you know some other runtime errors that could be uh, that could be noticed during build time by type checker and why would we need to you know wait half an hour for our tests to run to, to spot this or uh, why would we need to you know take uh, spend one hour to manually test our whole application to spot some kind of like this stupid mong bug this is so this is another thing that type systems can help us with so uh, when we when we decided that uh, that we want static typing, we had four options. We were uh, considering Elm, TypeScript, Reason, and PureScript. Uh, however, there were some requirements. And the first was that we needed good JavaScript interrupt. And this is because we knew uh, that it's not possible to migrate the whole code base at once to, to the particular language. So uh, we needed something that would work uh, really well with existing JavaScript code. That's why uh, Elm is out, because it's not that easy in Elm. Then uh, we wanted straightforward setup and good ID support. And, uh, you know, uh, we are kind of like smart kids. And we have all those fancy tools when working with JavaScript code. So we want to still have them. And uh, TypeScript is, uh, sorry, PureScript is uh, very great language, but unfortunately this ID support is not great. Uh, especially that we we are all using uh, the VS Code or WebStorm. So then uh, there was this long migration cost uh, aspect. And uh, you know, in here we wanted uh, for all our developers and contributors to uh, to be able to write new code uh, fast and to not kind of force them to learn something uh, totally new. And uh, Reason was a really strong competitor and we were, we were thinking about Reason for, for a while, but uh, TypeScript won in this regard. So uh, what was our approach and migration story? We decided to go with this fourth uh, approach with gradual adoption. And we had two key points uh, while doing this migration. The first one, the first one uh, was to, whenever doing something, all the new files uh, are going to be in TypeScript with no exceptions. And the second one was that, you know, with every pull request, we, uh, we were supposed to try to migrate some modules to TypeScript and to work uh, on this TypeScript migration with, with every other issue. So um, what do we started? At first, uh, going to be kind of like a timeline uh, of how it looked like uh, in Hasura. So first I did uh, TypeScript workshops uh, back when I was uh, in India, I did workshops for the whole company, not only for the front end people, but for whoever uh, was interested in, in TypeScript. And um, then, uh, in, I guess, in the middle of the March, no, on 5th of March, we uh, merged TypeScript uh, support. Uh, pull request of TypeScript support. And uh, yeah, and at this point, we kind of started thinking more about uh, this, uh, this migration. I created an issue uh, for external contributors to, you know, to uh, get some help with the migration. I created a list with uh, some, uh, some easy modules to, to migrate. 
and uh, some uh, some files that are a good fit for first issue. And uh, it was pretty surprising because there are many, many people who were uh, really happy about contributing. We got a lot of pull requests and people were all the time, please add more modules to this list. Please uh, tell me what I can work on and something like this. So it was it was really nice. And people were also super happy about, you know, their PRs getting merged. And um, yeah, at first uh, it, was, it might have been pretty confusing because we had basically no types of code in the, uh, in the console. So someone asked where we were keeping our types of code because there is none uh, on master. Uh, but yeah, but uh, it, it was getting better and better. And uh, right now we have more than 30 pull requests and uh, uh, over 20 were already merged. Pretty, pretty cool. And uh, one of the most outstanding ones so someone migrated all our Cypress-related code to TypeScript for these seven files. And uh, no, it wasn't only uh, renaming to uh, like files from JavaScript to TypeScript. Uh, the, the person, Raj, uh, he also, uh, you know, needed to do setup for TypeScript with Cypress, uh, fix some, our some of our tests and so on. So it was a lot of work. So uh, if by any chance uh, you're listening to this, then thank you very much for, for this uh, request. And yeah, this is how, how it looked like. So we started first conversations in February and then, you know, March was about adding TypeScript support. I from my, my about uh, getting uh, a lot of uh, pull requests from I'll say contributors. And uh, in June, we merged our first really big feature in, written in TypeScript. It was uh, 270 files, so quite a lot. And, uh, and yeah, as I said at the beginning, we had those expectations that, you know, we are going to work uh, with every pull request on this migration. But then the reality hit us and we had only uh, two or three people in the team and all of them were also responsible for some other projects or uh, some other stuff to do. We also had deadlines and we needed to, to ship features fast. Sometimes we, we also needed to, you know, uh, take something and get it merged the same day. So uh, it wasn't like uh, we, we were able to work on this TypeScript thing uh, with every, every code that we are writing, but uh, uh, we, we did try and we uh, did put a lot of work with that, but sometimes, you know, sometimes it was like, uh, this, is, this is, for example, small issue, small bug fix, so, uh, so someone would keep it in, in JavaScript. And, uh, Another thing was that not all people were familiar and comfortable with writing TypeScript. So uh, yeah, so it was it was pretty hard to uh, you know at first to uh, make everybody uh, write TypeScript and be comfortable with and confident about about this. So where are we now? Uh, so. Uh, right now we had we have uh, 300 over 300 uh, files in JavaScript and more than 200 in uh, TypeScript. And um, from the lines of code perspective, this is like we have 25% uh, of our code base in TypeScript. So it's still uh, uh, a lot of work. But we we did make, make uh, we did make some progress. We uh, I I am personally very happy about this. And uh, what's more, so uh, as we were doing this comparison, I wrote a blog post some time ago about you no know, uh, comparing um, your script reason and TypeScript. 
so you can check it out uh, if you want. And also, we still need help. So if, uh, if you have some free time and you want to contribute to Hasura, then uh, you can pick up some, uh, some part of the code base and uh, migrate to TypeScript. And uh, if you are interested in Hasura, you can check out our GraphQL and TypeScript tutorial and see how to build application using Hasura and TypeScript. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for attending. And uh, thank you for organizing this meetup. Yes, thank you very much, Alexandra. So we got some question. Uh, one question from uh, Paul that uh, didn't know about the DTS gen. Do you have any good experience using it uh, on a random uh, library? I mean, their readme is about yargs, and we know that add types exist. Uh, yes. Yeah, so unfortunately, I don't. Uh, I don't have good experience. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Sorry <laughs> about that. No. Um, no. Okay. Okay, and the, uh, the second question, I think you, you already answered because you show uh, something yeah. in the slide. Do you write uh, your Cypress test in TypeScript? Uh, yeah, we do. Right now we do, thanks to Raj, uh, uh, who migrated our Cypress code to TypeScript. Okay, great. And next, uh, I, I got a question. So when you started uh, TypeScript at Asura, were there any people against it? And if yes, have they, have they changed their mind and what TypeScript feature contribute to this? Uh, yes, yeah. so I think there were people against TypeScript. Um, and yeah, and the reason was that they were more, more into other uh, languages, for example, Reason. So, um, you know, uh, it was like, uh, just, just a choice of language, not specifically uh, that TypeScript is bad. But I think over time they changed their mind because you know the, then uh, then as we had more and more code in TypeScript and we were doing some refactors, then uh, you know I remember getting some message that from from the person that was skeptical about TypeScript at first that types are so cool and TypeScript is so cool because uh, refactoring is so easy with TypeScript. So, uh, yeah, so I guess that's it. And right now I think people are, are pretty happy about this, like uh, at least developers, I don't know about other <laughs> people. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. So is there any other question? I don't see any other question. Okay, so uh, so if you have some other question, you can uh, you can ask uh, Alexandra directly. I think uh, maybe on Twitter or something like that. Or uh, and uh, and that's all. Uh, don't know about the next uh, meetup. Uh, we will uh, announce that uh, with the Twitter account. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you to our all speaker. Thank you very much to be there and to, for your talk. That was uh, very great. And thank you to all the viewers on the, on the channel. And uh, see you later.